Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to PVL 2601. I am your lecturer and I will be teaching on this uh, session. We will be focusing on study unit three for this session, which is the invariable consequences of a civil marriage. This is found on chapter, this is chapter five of on your textbook and in your study guide, it is study unit three. So let me try to go there. Okay, study unit three. The main purpose of this study is that we focus on the consequences of a civil marriage that cannot be changed by spouse. This means they are invariable. So I looked up the word invariable for understanding purposes so we get to understand what it means. So according to the Oxford Dictionary, Invariable means never changing, uh, which further relates that it relates mainly to the spouse, the spouse's estate, the, the proprietary consequences of the marriage. So for the case of study this, for the study unit, we will be looking at the invariable consequences of a civil marriage, meaning that they cannot be changed. Uh, for example, the, the, the their status as husband and wife as they enter into their marriage cannot be changed. So we will firstly, this con consist of one, the status of the spouses, which I just mentioned, but we'll go through it. And then we will focus again on the consortium omnimas vetae, which is the, 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 the second uh, um, consequence that we will look at. The th third one is the spousal maintenance. The th fourth one is the matrimonial home. The fifth one is the donation between the spouses. The sixth one is the, the family name. So I'm going to go in into each and every topic that I just mentioned so that we have a clear understanding of what it contains. Firstly, the status of the spouses, as I, as I have mentioned, whether, whether the spouse, the husband and the wife enter into the marriage, their status changes to wife and husband, and that cannot be changed. So when you look at chapter, at, uh, Chapter five years of your textbook, which is on page 41. It gives us an examples of what that means. What uh, it, it further gives us examples similar to the one that I just given of what it means to where the spouses cannot change, where, the, where, the, where their status cannot be changed. Uh, the first one it speaks about saying that neither spouses can enter into another civil marriage or another customary marriage or a civil union in this matter. So which means that their customary that their, their civil marriage stands and they will be parties to that very one marriage. Uh, and then it speaks number two speaks of the limitation that or the in, or uh, hindrances or obstruction that may come with the results of uh, the marriage, which can relate or come through from the relationship of affinity, as we have mentioned. Remember the feminist and uh, the degree of of relationships of in in, in infinity. We mentioned it in study unit one. So these are the reasons why this can change when they enter into their marriage. And a right of interstate section, succession is created between the spouses, which means if they are married to, since the world they are married to each other, uh, should they, one of them, which should their marriage dissolve in death, then they, uh, they enter also into interstate succession. 
uh, the result of the civil marriage where uh, the, the parents, both the couple, the, the mother, the, the wife and the husband, and have children together or enter into their marriage before the children are born, they be, those children, they become the, they, they become the parents, the married parents of the children. And if where the spouses have full parental responsibility and rights and respect of the children born of their marriage, that does not change. And well, the, the, the spouse's capacity to act is also is, is restricted if they're married in community of property, meaning that even when entering into contract, that can also be a factor. Where a spouse is a minor and is and marries. When they marry, uh, um, okay. When when they get married, when, when a spouse gets married, when they are a minor, when they when the marriage is complete, uh, they they attain majority. So that's where the status of the spouses changes. So we're going to go to the second factor that contributes to the invariation of consequences of a civil marriage, which is the constium omnimus vetae. This includes material and immaterial things. Uh, this was also demonstrated in the case of Hrobla versus Havenga, where the court defined constatium omnimus vetae as an abstraction comp comprising the totality of a number of rights, duties, and advantages occurring to the spouses of the marriage. One spouse cannot enforce an affection by the means of a court order or an interdict, or an interdict to prevent the other from infringing uh, their rights. Okay, so what here, what, what it means here, it means that both the spouses have duties that they need to perform. Uh, in that marriage to each other. However, in this case of uh, Robla and Havenga, it was stated that one cannot bring a, 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 a case uh, of uh, where they feel that the other spouse is not affectionate enough to them, to a court. Like the court cannot order one to be affectionate to the other. As much as one, it's as much as there is a duty of uh, affection on each other, but the court cannot cannot order one one's party to be affectionate to the other party. So the example of that is also when leaving uh, the, the matrimonial home. The right to family life and the right to dignity, those are the ones that one can bring to the court, but not the right of affection. I don't think there's such a right that one has a right to affection in a marriage, though it is a duty that one needs to give, or that the parties need to give to each other in a marriage. However, that cannot be brought to court and the court cannot decide on that matter. So we proceed to the third factor, which contributes to the invariation of the invariable consequences of a civil marriage, which is the spousal maintenance. So in the spousal, concerning the spousal maintenance, there are three factors involved. So we will also look, look at them, which is uh, the reciprocal duty of support. The second one is the household necessities. And the third one is the Maintenance Act. In the Maintenance Act, it comprises of a maintenance complainant and maintenance inquiry, uh, and it also contains of an order that the court may make, and also the appeal. And fourthly, on the spousal maintenance is the on the spousal maintenance is the enforcement of a maintenance order. So I will we will get into that in each and every one of those factors that that does mention. So the spousal maintenance 
it is a reciprocal duty for both parties, for the both husband and the wife to receive to uh, give spousal support to each to each other. What this means, it means that the husband can also claim for spousal maintenance. So is the wife as it has the right also to claim the spousal maintenance from the husband. In Rineke and Rineke, the court pointed out that a maintenance order can only be satisfied that a person's maintenance is claimed, is able to pay for it. So what it means that the husband, when he claims the maintenance from the wife, it must be that the, the wife is able to pay the maintenance. So you cannot ask maintenance from someone who is unable to provide to maintain you. So that also applies to both parties. If the wife cannot maintain the husband, so uh, the maintenance order will not suffice. When the husband cannot maintain the wife, so the court order cannot um, that the court cannot order such a maintenance. The liability against the third party in the reciprocal duty of the spouses. In a marriage concluded in community of property, the debt will be settled from the joint estate. This means that, for example, if both of the parties, uh, there is a, 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 a third person who is claiming liability from their marriage or their estate, that will come, the debt will be settled from their uh, their joint estate. So how how is this termin how is this uh, duty of support terminated? You know, there's something there's always something that everything begins and then there's an ending, right? So now the reciprocal uh, duty of support is terminated by either death or by divorce. However, in the divorce there's a decree that will be provided by the court. And if in that divorce, there can also be instituted a maintenance order in favor of one spouse. Where there's a separation, where the separation is due to one spouse who supports the other, sp uh, the other as, as spouse, the duty of support continues. For example, if you were to, uh, if you and your partner, if you and your husband, if you and your wife were separated or you were in a process of separation and the, the, the separation is due, it, it's given to you, it's awarded or ordered by the court, it's granted by the court, the spouse who was supporting the other spouse continues supporting them. So the separation does not and the separate the, 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 uh, does not end the support of the other spouse. So we move to the to household necessities. In the household necessities, we are going to look at the requirements of the capacity. And we're going also to look at the revocation of the spouses of capacity. And we will also focus also on the defense on the purchase, which was not necessary. So now, on the household necessities, the duty to support coincides with the duty to contribute to household necessities. Which means that if it, the 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 way where we just mentioned now, uh, where the both parties are equivalent to support each other, that also falls through to the household necessities. The requirements for the capacity to incur debts for household necessities, where a spouse capacity to purchase household necessities depends on the existence of a valid civil marriage and a joint household. So then firstly, there must be 
uh, for a household necessity to be possible or to be contributed to, there must be a valid marriage, existing valid marriage between the spouses. Secondly, there must be a joint household, meaning that if we were to contribute to the toiletries and uh, groceries, they must be contributed to a joint, we must be in a joint household. So meaning the husband and wife must be staying together. The third requirement is the that the transaction must relate to the household necessities, meaning that uh, things like you cannot include your uh, makeup as a necessity to uh, as a as a household necessity. Uh, you can not include uh, your personal uh, beverage, uh, adult beverage, if I may say. <laughs> To your to the household necessities, but if collectively the 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 the, the, the uh, for entertainment as uh, purposes you believe you decide you want to uh, get uh, certain beverages as part of the household necessity that will be included. But if it's only benefiting to one spouse, that cannot be con uh, regarded as a household necessity. So, for the household necessities, there must be a revocation of a spouse capacity to purchase household necessities. It can be done by means of a court order. Now here, whereby the other party does not contribute to household necessities, whereby the other party does not uh, by uh, by electricity contribute to groceries doesn't contribute to toiletries to the things that are used or helped in the household. One spouse who is concerned can approach the court, and the court can order can make an order on 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 such a a, a claim. Secondly, by the spouse. The spouse can, I think this is on page 48, yes. This is on page 48 of your textbook. Where the spouse, uh, the revocation of uh, the limitation can be done by the spouse, which means the revocation can be done by either the, the by, by means of a court order, or by the spouse. So because the capacity is not based on the agency, but be, but be, but comes into existence by Lex Lechia, when a valid marriage and a joint estate come into existence. So the revocation can also be done by the spouse. So thirdly, on the revocation or the limitation of a spouse capacity to purchase household necessities can be done by the defense that the purchase was not necessary because one spouse had made sufficient funds available to the other. This is also, this uh, requirement is seen in the case of Rillement versus Ramsey. The court rejected the defense by adopting an ab ab objective approach. And it viewed the facts from the dealer's point of view. Had the court adopted to the objective approach, the defense would probably have succeeded because by household items on credit would not have been deemed reasonably necessary in a household which has already been provided with sufficient fund. And that is on your textbook in page 49. So now we're done with the household necessities. 
we move to the Maintenance Act. The Maintenance Act, it does not cover maintenance between spouses, but it incorporates any matter where a person might be entitled to maintenance, which also includes uh, partners in a lifetime, in a life partnership who agreed to maintain each other. In the Maintenance Act, we the first item we're going to the, the first factor is the maintenance, the maintenance complainant and the maintenance inquiry. So firstly, for one to bring the maintenance a complainant to the court or to the maintenance officers, is that the maintenance officer will then investigate the complainant and decide whether or not to institute a maintenance inquiry. So for there to be a maintenance claim, there must be the, the, the inquiry first must be investigated by the maintenance officer. Remember, we did we mentioned about the uh, spousal maintenance where the spouse who claims the maintenance from the other that very spouse must be able to maintain or be able to yes, be able to maintain that spouse. So you cannot claim maintenance from someone who cannot who is unable to maintain. For example, uh, what they look at, what, what what they look at, what the maintenance officer will investigate is whether this person has can economically maintain this this person, the person who's doing maintenance, whether they have a job, whether they have a business, yes, in that mid, in that in that order. So the, the, the maintenance officer will then investigate the complainant and then will decide whether to institute a maintenance inquiry in the maintenance court. So that is how the maintenance gets to arrive to a court, to a maintenance court. Then the maintenance investigator in the court required to locate a person who is liable to pay the maintenance or can provide re relevant information Take statement from anyone who can be the assistant of the maintenance court. So that is the 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 the, the, the maintenance court has the power to, to take statements from anyone regarding this case, regarding a maintenance case, right? So where the court Court has the power to issue direction, compiling an electronic communication services provided to supply information, which can be used to trace a person who may be able to, who may, who may be affected by the court, by the order of the court. So now that now this is basically just explaining the procedure on how the court or how the, the, the maintenance is the, the maintenance investigation is is goes about the order the court makes for the payment of the maintenance to the person is entitled to maintenance And then there is also yeah, the court, the orders, okay, the, 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 the maintenance act orders the court to make the order. So meaning that according to the maintenance order, the court has the right to now make the order. After the investigation has been done and then they're satisfied that this person is capable or is able to maintain this person. Now the order is made by the court. When the order is made by the court, now the person whom the, ma the maintenance is made against can all has the right to also appeal. I've uh, been in, in maintenance uh, uh, say, uh, court cases where one would appeal to the amount of the money that was expected of that person of that person to pay. 
So the person who the maintenance is against, the court, the maintenance orders against, can bring an appeal to the High Court. It does not suspend the duty to pay maintenance under the maintenance order unless the appellant alleges that he is not legally liable to pay the maintenance. For example, even when the maintenance order has been granted and the person uh, maybe has a job or is on a contract or that he has a job, you know how life happens. So now the person can also bring the appeal to the court later and then says, no, you know, I cannot afford to, the, to pay the maintenance. Where the court has granted the maintenance order, the, per the person whom the maintenance is against must pay the maintenance. Even if they appeal, they continue pay. Say, for example, uh, today's the 25th. So the, today the court order is out, right? And then the person has to pay maintenance starting from the 30th of August. The date does not change because the person has appealed. The date still continues until there is a new judgment from the appeal which uh, overrides the court order. Then the then the then the maintenance will will stop. But if the maintenance is if the maintenance if the appeal is still to be attended to and to be decided against, to be decided over, the maintenance order still stands. So we move on to. Okay, the enforcement of a maintenance order. So where one person does not want to, does not appeal and does not want to pay, does not pay the maintenance, what happens to that person? So there is a civil sanction that may occur or a criminal sanction. I remember, I think it was maybe in 2019 or 2018 when President Zuma, when the president of South Africa was still President Zuma, he did... Uh, state an, a, a new enforcement uh, sanction, a, civ, a, a, a criminal a sanction, a, a sanction to enforce maintenance of a, a three months imprisonment. You need to check that on your, um, it's in the Maintenance Act, it was amended, that the sanction the, the criminal sanction is three months imprisonment. It's, yes, the, it's a minimum of three months imprisonment. So now we move on to our fifth invariable consequence of a civil marriage, which is the matrimonial home. So a matrimonial home, which is shared between the spouses, both spouses have the right to occupy the household and use the household assets. Remember, in the in in the past, uh, under the spousal maintenance, we mentioned the household necessities. So, in the matrimonial home, we, we mentioned that the the, the spousal the, the household maintenance necessities need to come from both of the of, of the parties right who share a and the purchases must be done from a joint a, estate so even in the matrimonial home it states that both spouses must ha have the right to occupy the home meaning the other spouse cannot evict or chase the other spouse out of the matrimonial home and the using of household assets, one cannot uh, one cannot deny the other spouse the right to use the household assets. So that is also found in your textbook. Let me try to. This is also found in your textbook. 
on page on page 57. Yes. So there's a rule that uh, is that on the matrimonial home. It says that the owing or the renting spouse may not eject the other spouse from the matrimonial home without providing him or her with suitable alternative accommodation. So the rule from, as I just mentioned, that both spouses have the right to occupy the matrimonial home. So the, the, the party or the spouse who is owning or who is renting, who the home is under their name, maybe they have a title deed uh, specifying that they are the owner of the home. They are the sole owner of the home or they are the leasee of the renting home. Should they decide to eject the other spouse from the matrimonial home, they cannot do so without providing that spouse an alternative accommodation. Meaning, if you were to if you were to decide to eject your spouse from your home, you must provide them with an alternative accommodation. So we're going to. Also, it also applies. Sorry, it also applies even when in situations where there's a where there's domestic violence. The the spouse who does not feel safe in the home, the accommodation has to be provided for for that person. So the Domestic Violence Act prevents the other spouse from entering the matrimonial home or part of it. So this can also even be done by a, a protection order where, there's a, where the other spouse experiences domestic violence. They can, only, they can only have the other spouse be removed from the home uh, if there is a threat of domestic violence. Those are the other exception to the rule of the right to occupy, to jointly occupy the household. The sixth, now we move on to the sixth variable consequence of a civil marriage, which is the donation, the donations and between the spouses. So the donation between the spouses. So before the commencement of the Matrimonial Property Act on November 1984, spouses were married, who were married out of community of property were prohibited from making donations to each other. Any donation which was made in contravention of the of the prohibition was valuable and an instance of the donor. So now even the donations made to the spouse before the commencement of the act were valid. Part of the reason why the prohibition on, on the donation between the spouses existed was because the spouses create creditors could be seriously prejudiced if the spouses could freely make donations to each other. The other reason why the prohibition on the donation did not apply to marriages in community of property was simply that the spouses who married in community of property can generally not make donations to each other because they own the joint estate in and un undivided and indivisible half sheets. So if the spouse were to make a donation to one another, the donation the donated item would simply come out of the of the uh, joint estate and fall back to it, which is a uh, plain. The donation would therefore have no effect. So now where the donation, 
where as, as commun as a community of property still entails that each spouse owns an undivided and divisible half share of the joint estate. The abolish of the prohibition of the donation between the spouses has no application in the marriages in community of property unless the donor spouse donates one of his or her separate as assets to the other spouse subject to the provision that the donation must be excluded from that joint estate. So uh, the donation between spouses, it was prohibited between the spouses who are married in community of property, who were built out of community of property. It, then even when the the spouses who the spouses who now are married in community of property, the the prohibition did not apply. Why? Because both spouses would be giving each will be donating to each other from their joint estate. However, there's a rule. There's an exception to that rule. It states, it states that unless the donor spouse donates, the, the donate the one the spouse that donates to the other spouse donates from their separate asset, and the sub there's a subject and the subject to the provision that the donation must be excluded to that joint estate. So that is the exception to the rule. Now we move to our seventh, the seventh and variable consequence of the civil marriage, which is the family name. You know how in 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 when in in marriages where the the wife was to take is always to take the the name or the surname of the husband. According to section twenty six one of the the birth and death registration act the wife may assume her husband's surname or after having assumed his husband's surname resume a surname which she bore at any time or add her surname to the husband's surname at any prior time this means that uh, the, the the wife, as much as the wife can take the is to take the husband's surname, she can also use her surname or use both her maiden name and her husband's surname. That is called a double barreling of sin, that double barrel surname. That only happens to the woman. The husband, <laughs> the husband, however, does not have an option of changing the same. The husband cannot assume the husband, the wife's surname, or add on the husband, the, the wife's surname. However, if he wants to assume his wife's surname or add it to his own, he must apply to the Director General of Home Affairs for permission to do so. So that is the on the family name. The wife can can use the husband's surname. After have using the husband's surname, can also resume to her maiden name at any time. the The wife can also use both the her maiden name and, and the husband's name. That is not the case with the husband. However, if they decide to use the husband, they use uh, the to add to use their wife's surname or add on to their wife's surname, they need to approach the director general of the home affairs for permission to do so. Lastly, the headship of the family. In terms of common law, the husband is the head of the family. This was expressed incorporated into, into by section 13 
of the Matrimonial Property Act. The legislature attempted to remove the husband's headship from our law by deleting the reference to it from Section 30. However, the true source of the rule is the common law and not Section 30. The deletion of, did not achieve what the legislator had in mind for the deleting, merely reinstating and common law position. Section 11 of the Matrimonial Property Act abolished the husband's marital power over the person and the property of his wife, but it is silent on his headship in the family. So we're going to look at two examples that were provided for in your textbook uh, concerning section 11, the abolition of the husband's marital power. So remember there's the marital power and there's also the headship of the family. If a husband and it literally decided that the family should move to another town or a country. He must, he would be attempting the exercise of power over their wives. If he and literally determines the lifestyle of the of the spouse, he would be attempting to exercise power over his wife's property. If her property had to be used to finance this lifestyle. His decision regarding their lifestyle might also involve exercising a power over his wife's person. So that, that that's basically explaining uh, section 11, the reason why the marital power was then abolished. But the, this section, however, is silent regarding the headship of the family. So the common rule, the common law rule states that the husband is the head of the family. So we see here even in there was a decision on this on this on this act on the abolition of the, of the husband's marital power over the person and property of his wife, where the legislature stimulately divested the husband of most elements of the headship of the family. Furthermore, applying the purpose of extent, extentualist and constitution consistent interpretation of the legislation indicated by the constitutional court which is, you can also see this even in, even it's stated even in chapter three of our study, of our, of our textbook, where it talks about the status of, yes. So the headship of the family, still stands as common law that the husband is the head of the family. That brings us to the end of our session. Should you have any questions relating to study unit three, please share them or state them in, your in the description box and we, I will respond and answer your questions. Thank you very much. All the best with your studies.